In our timeline, the year 2017 was all about one graphics card series, Pascal. Sitting atop that throne was the 1080 Ti, arguably the last great enthusiast graphics card from Nvidia that would remain wholly relevant almost to this very day. There was precious little the multi-billion dollar underdogs at AMD could offer by the way of competition at the very top end of the markets, but what if there had been? Despite being comparable in horsepower to the legendary GTX 1080 Ti, the Radeon 7 wasn't thought of with the same reverence. For one thing, it was a paper launch, never even reaching shelves in many places. The other big problem was timing. The Radeon 7 launched two years after the 1080 Ti, and while the 7 would have been a perfect foil for the last great GTX, it was instead competing with the RTX 2080, a card that, while only slightly faster and short of about half the VRAM, looked several generations more advanced than the Radeon thanks to hardware ray tracing and deep learning super sampling. In the real world, the 1080 Ti went unchallenged in 2017 and 2018, and AMD were left behind. But what if we lived in an alternate timeline? What if things had worked out differently? If TSMC had been able to push 7 nanometer production forward by a couple of years, if HBM yields had been higher, and the Radeon 7 had launched closer to the original Vega cards, how would it have compared to the 1080 Ti in its prime? My original plan for this video was simply to compare the data I already have, to see which card is better in modern games. That's the channel motto after all. I tested both cards in the last few months, and I only intended to update a couple of tests, maybe add some new titles to the mix, and I am still going to do that, however I decided that it's not a particularly interesting question. The 1080 Ti is a card that existing owners should still be comfortable holding onto, but upgrading from it now is relatively trivial. The Radeon 7 is currently still overpriced, harder to find, and apparently more prone to failures. Whatever the benchmark results, the Radeon already lost. Instead, I decided to ask a different question. The Radeon 7 looked doomed from the start, but what if we could change its origin story? What if the Radeon 7 and 1080 Ti launched on the same day? How would they have compared in games from 2017, 2018 and beyond? On paper, the Radeon has a couple of distinct advantages. The 16GB of HBM2 is larger and faster than the 1080 Ti's frame buffer, and yet, in terms of raw numbers in Time Spy and Fire Strike, the 1080 Ti still maintains a small advantage. To try out this hypothetical scenario, my test platform is completely inappropriate for the period of 2017 through 2019. Or should I say platforms? While the original moderately priced test rig was used to gather the data from 2020s era games, I've since retired that PC and lent the Ryzen 5 5600X to Hardware Lab, so I had to test the older titles with my editing rig. The CPU is the Ryzen 7 5700X, and the RAM is now two sticks of dual rank rather than four sticks of single rank memory, though clocks and timings are the same. I decided to stick with the latest drivers for each card. This obviously isn't very realistic, historically speaking, but drivers for the Radeon 7 don't exist before 2019, so no solution would be completely accurate. Let's not get too bogged down with details and just try to have fun, yeah? Looking back at some of the early reviews of the GTX 1080 Ti from the first quarter of 2017, one of the most popular titles tested was Grand Theft Auto V. Different times, I guess. Anyway, this little-known title from DMA Design performs like a rock star on the 1080 Ti. Maybe I was being too conservative by skimping on the multi-sample anti-aliasing, but with FXAA and everything else maxed out, the game still runs at 120fps at 1440p. Naturally, a 2017-era CPU like an i7-8700K wouldn't have done quite so well. In my 2017-era build from earlier this year, it ran the same test at 95 FPS, so the extra horsepower of the Ryzen 5700X is making a hell of a difference. So how about the time-travelling Radeon? 
Well, I don't know how much of this is down to a lack of driver optimization and how much is just a preference for Nvidia hardware, but the Radeon 7 doesn't quite make the grade here. At just 91 FPS on average, the AMD card is about 25% slower than the GeForce. However, there are two takeaways from this. Firstly, the 2017 era CPU would have been holding back the Nvidia, so would only have a 5% advantage in that context. Secondly, it's still managing a locked 60 plus experience. Neither of those is much comfort for AMD stands, but it, it's the best I got. Fast forwarding to a few months after the release of the 1080 Ti, 2017's Assassin's Creed Origins once again has a strong preference for the GeForce. At 1440 Ultra, the Radeon is hitting a solid 65 FPS average, but suffers a little from stutters, bringing 1% lows down to just 37. The 1080 Ti starts a lot higher than the AMD and doesn't fall anywhere near as far, averages top 80 FPS and lows are only just below 70. Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice is from that era of games where DX12 was stuttery as all hell, so 1% lows are pretty bad on both. On reflection, I should maybe have switched to DX11, but we live and learn. Both cards only manage a 1% low of under 37 FPS, but their averages are wildly different. The 1080 Ti almost hits 85 FPS, whereas the Radeon 7 is only just over 70. Finally, a game that doesn't seem to automatically hate the Radeon, 2017's Prey from Arcane Studios gives a slightly more even-handed picture of how these GPUs should perform, with the Radeon passing 130 FPS on average, while the 1080 Ti is approaching 140. No doubt you'd struggle to tell the two apart, especially given the near-identical 1% lows. Moving into 2018, Shadow of the Tomb Raider will go on to become a showcase title for the new RTX series cards. Nevertheless, even without ray-traced shadows, both cards can produce a stunning image at superb frame rates. At 1440p highest quality, the 1080 Ti averages 89 FPS with lows of 85, with the Radeon only losing about 5 FPS and still holding well above the threshold for playability. I made a small mistake in testing F1 2018, both cards were tested at the same resolution and quality settings, but I accidentally left checkerboard rendering on. This is why the FPS is insanely high. The GeForce hits 163 FPS, whereas the Radeon manages 160. Again, basically indistinguishable, and I'm not 100% sure the best CPUs of 2018 would have supported such a high frame rate anyway. Remedy's Control was a beastly game to run compared to a lot of the titles we've looked at so far. Neither GPU can manage to hit 60 FPS at 1440 high, so 1080p makes more sense, unless you're happy to drop a couple of quality settings. Nevertheless, this is quite a turn up for the books. The Radeon 7 actually wins its first matchup, beating the 1080 Ti with a score of nearly 57 FPS at 1440 and nearly 87 at 1080. The difference is small, but noticeable particularly at the higher resolution. If you're cheering for Team Red, this one should keep your spirits up too. Red Dead Redemption 2 runs on Vulcan, which is territory where the 1080 Ti has a small disadvantage, and that shows in the benchmarks. At 1440, with the quality slider moved to the first level of favour quality, it averages 51 FPS with minimums under 37. The Radeon 7 beats that by a little under 10%, averaging 56, though lows are basically the same. Dropping resolution to 1080p makes both cards a little more playable, with the 1080 Ti climbing to 63 FPS and the Radeon to 68.5. The 7 does lose out in minimums though. Moving into 2020 with another Vulcan-based title, Doom Eternal is almost perfectly level between the two GPUs. Although you might expect better from the Radeon, they both come in at roughly 154 FPS on average. The 1% lows actually favour the 1080 Ti, in fact, beating the 7 by about 20 FPS, though whether that would be noticeable in the long run would be debatable. 
Cyberpunk 2077 is a title that always tends to favour Nvidia hardware, and comparing the 1080 Ti versus a two-year younger AMD model makes that embarrassingly clear. At 1080 high, the GeForce can pass the 60 FPS mark, whereas the 7 only manages 45 at the same settings. Interestingly, the generational gap between GCN 5.1 and RDNA 1 is pretty huge in this title, as the RX 5700 XT roughly equals the 1080 Ti here, and even the 5600 XT can pass 50 FPS. Forza Horizon 5 is a little more brand agnostic in terms of performance and also lets me turn the resolution back up to 1440 while maintaining a mostly 60 plus average on both cards. In this scenario there's nothing between them with less than a frame difference on average and a couple more at the low end. Technically the win goes to the GTX but it shouldn't affect a buying decision. Halo Infinite is also brand agnostic, but in a different way. It treats both cards abysmally. From the last couple of years worth of testing, I found that anything older than Turing or RDNA 1 will perform disproportionately poorly, while both cards are roughly equal at a 74 FPS average and 1% lows just above 60. They're also on par with the far cheaper and generally weaker RTX 2060 at the same settings. Marvel's Spider-Man released about five years after the 1080 Ti hit the market, so it's pretty amazing to me that it can run at 1440p very high at 85 FPS. Lows in the mid 40s are a minor downside, and one that the Radeon 7 handles a little better. The average is only a couple frames off the pace, but the 1% lows are almost 10% higher, possibly as a result of that extra 5GB frame buffer or maybe just down to the architecture. After all, the game was originally made for PS4, which ran on older revisions of the same GCN architecture. Once again, I'm impressed to see both these cards handle a demanding modern game. A Plague Tale Requiem isn't a huge open world, but it does have a ton of fine detail and realistic environments to render, and while both the 1080 Ti and Radeon 7 have to drop to 1080p to achieve a 60 plus average, they both manage to surpass the RX 5700 XT. The Last of Us sparked a lot of conversations about VRAM this year, and for once, both of these older graphics cards have that aspect covered. The 1080 Ti and Radeon 7 can both handle 1080 high without compromising on settings or texture quality, and both can hit the 60 mark on average. Once again, the 1% lows favour the Radeon, most likely because of that bigger buffer. Interestingly, Ratchet & Clank is built on the same engine as Spider-Man, but drastically prefers Pascal here. The 1080 Ti wins on average to the tune of 10%, approaching the 80 FPS mark rather than the low 70s of the Radeon 7. In terms of 1% lows, the difference is much narrower, both falling to below 45 FPS. On the positive side, these are old cards running a very demanding new game. I often find myself testing this game at medium, even on newer cards, and both of these old workhorses can handle 1080 high while remaining playable. The last time I tested Jedi Survivor with the 1080 Ti, it scored somewhat higher than this. My notes for that video had it running at near 70 FPS at 1080 high. Well, since then, performance in this game has been refined somewhat, but Respawn also fixed an ambient occlusion bug which may be the reason why it no longer performs quite so well. The 1080 Ti falls under 60 FPS on average, and the Radeon 7 actually wins by a couple of frames. The 1% lows also favour the newer card, probably thanks to all that HBM. Another VRAM hungry title and another win for the 7, this time a way bigger one. The 1080 Ti can run Resident Evil Remake at almost 90 FPS at 1080 max settings without RT, whereas the Radeon beats that by almost 6 frames. Lows are much lower, with both cards hitting 1% of about 73 FPS. The only difference to note is that the Radeon is playing with every quality setting maxed out, 
again, barring ray tracing, but the 1080 Ti needed the textures dropping to the 4GB setting in order to keep from entering the red zone. Again, I went back and revisited Starfield's performance on the 1080 Ti. My last test of this game with the Pascal card was back when Starfield was first released, and 1080 High was barely scraping over 30 FPS at the time. Since then, the game has been updated to improve performance on GeForce cards, and that has helped... a bit. Averages now hit just over 40 FPS in my test scene, whereas lows are in the low 30s and you should expect busier areas like Aquila and New Atlantis to be even rougher. The Radeon 7 meanwhile offers a much more playable experience, completing the test seen at about 55 FPS with lows of 48. Finally, a, a sign of things to come for the two aging combatants. While Remedy aren't lending out their Northlight engine left, right and centre, mesh shaders probably won't remain exclusive to Alan Wake 2 for very long. There's nothing stopping developers from using this DX12 Ultimate feature, and that's going to cause problems, not just for Pascal and GCN, but even first generation RDNA cards. The results? Well, the 1080 Ti runs the game at lowest settings, just above 20 FPS about 25% lower than a GTX 1650 Super. The Radeon 7 meanwhile gets a DNF. Technically frames are being rendered, but this is a slightly more surreal experience than I think Sam Lake originally intended. I'll admit then, this idea was fun, but not exactly flattering for the Radeon 7. If I'd fixed my attention on modern titles, the younger GPU would have held its own a little better, I think. Outliers like Starfield and Cyberpunk have very obvious brand preferences, but on the whole, the results are pretty similar between the two. Looking back to older titles released in the days before the Radeon 7 actually released in the real timeline, quite a few of them performed worse than I'd have hoped. Maybe I missed some titles that were particularly AMD-focused from that era, I skipped Doom 2016 on the grounds that I was testing Doom Eternal, but I'm sure they'd have been at least comparable. Off the top of my head, uh, the only other AMD preferred game that comes to mind is Ashes of the Singularity, which I don't own. So, what's the conclusion? Well, as much as I want AMD cards to be competitive with Nvidia, maybe having a flagship in 2017 wasn't all that important after all. In reality, the first gen Vega GPUs launched shortly after the 1080 Ti, and everyone was disappointed that they were only positioned to face off with the GTX 1070 and 1080. However, I think that would have always been the case, even if they had been ready to launch something as potent as the Radeon 7 back in 2017. Thankfully, as games have come to rely on features that the Radeon 7 excels in, the performance gap has closed over time, and the two cards are neck and neck in modern games. And more to the point, they're actually still doing pretty well. Which makes it all the sadder to see that they're being made forcibly obsolete, with AMD cancelling driver updates for GCN 5.1 and older, and Nvidia once more finding one of their former high-end products lacking in terms of API support. Hence why this video is more about piquing my curiosity rather than actual buying advice. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.